Hi, this is Rod Meldrum, the Book of Mormon Evidence Guy. I'm excited about uh, this next series of, uh, of videos that we're doing together and, and these episodes that we're doing. I have with me my dear friend Ryan Nelson. He is our events manager and, and dear friend and, and, and confidant and so forth. And he's, uh, we, we're going to be doing one of the, what, I, what I hope to be one of the deepest dives ever on the geography of the Book of Mormon. This is the actual lands of the Book of Mormon. And, uh, and so just a, as a little uh, introduction here, so about 15 years ago, I had this five DVD set that we did um, that, uh, that, that had a ton of information in it about geography. And kind of like what we did, what uh, Jonathan Neville and I did with a previous video, this is disc number five of that five DVD set. And, uh, and I, I really want to show people that this has all been a process, <laughs> you know? Um, what I knew 15 years ago um, is pretty evident in the DVD. We're going to watch that and then we're going to stop and make commentary and, and update that DVD basically is what we're going to be doing with Ryan. So Ryan has been in, involved with, uh, with Jonathan Neville also in, in, in making a couple of books that have uh, to do with the geography. He's, uh, he's a, 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 a real student of this whole thing and I'm excited about having him uh, share with you uh, some additional insights. So we're going to go ahead and uh, so don't don't forget to uh, to click down below here to subscribe. Make sure you're subscribing to this so you can see these episodes uh, that are coming up. But like, just like the uh, Joseph New 2.0, <laughs> this is going to be uh, Book of Mormon Geography 2.0, and uh, so let's let's just just jump into it. So let's go ahead and we'll start the uh, the video here, and we'll learn some more about it. blowing out. Hello, I'm David Lindsley. That's better. And I have painted over the course of several years, several paintings for the church. One of the paintings I've done was this one here is called Behold Your Little Ones. I did this painting way back in 1983. It's the scene where Christ is appearing to the Nephites and Lamanites in 3rd Nephi. Since I painted that painting, I've been wanting to update it and um, to uh, make some modifications. This is my version 2.0. And so here is the painting that I'm working on and I have Christ and, and the various children. But rather than the Mayan, Aztec type of painting or buildings that I had in the background the first time, this time, I mean, let's do something, let's do a little more accurately. And now we're going to have the, the mound uh, from from North America and so I'm painting the the mound in here as replacement and so this will be uh, a much more accurate representation than what I've had before but I'm really excited about having this type of painting where we have Christ and the children and the third Nephi scene but not in South America but in Ohio or um, uh, Michigan or wherever the scene had taken place. Now these are wood buildings and this is a grass covered mound and then these would be steps here and some trees over here and then um, and I'm going to put a, a, a pole right here and then there are also some other poles right here I think I think would be really good to have and there was a pole here, then this is the outside fence. They don't know exactly how the, the buildings looked. Uh, just, they figured, well, it was probably some sort of thatched roof and uh, definitely had wood fencing and wood posts on top, of the, on top of the mound. And then there was a wood staircase here, but they're not stone and, uh, as, as uh, down in South America. On the children, um, I've de what I've tried to depict here is both Nephites and Lamanites. And so uh, I've dressed them in a costumes that I think are probably appropriate for either Nephites and Lamanites. But on this particular painting, I wanted to just to focus on Christ and, and the children here and with the light coming in from the side, giving it 
kind of a three-dimensional look to it. to say <laughs> that that was a great that was a great experience that was uh, one of our very first uh, conferences that we ever did up at the Zermatt Resort and uh, having David come and and, uh, and and show that painting and uh, I have a little I have a little surprise for us actually here just just give me one one second actually here. he has a lot of surprises Rod does there's so much cool information we're going to share today and you, you need some help with this one <laughs> but here it comes here we come, here we go. You help me hold that up there, Ryan, brother? All right. So that is the, uh, the, the, the finished painting. And uh, the, I, I, I told Dave, I said, I wanna have the first, the first actual Gicle copy of it. So this is actually number one of 500, so there we but go. But it's heavy. It's kinda heavy. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so a little shout out to David Lindsley. So uh, he has had uh, so many great paintings that the church has used over the years. In fact, the, uh, the, the, the painting of Joseph Smith that was used on the, the main on the, one that on, on the Joseph Smith manual and so right. forth um, in the prophets series of the, of the church was actually the last year one, I think. Yeah, yeah painted by him. So there we go. That's just wanted to touch bases with, uh, with, with David Lindsley on that. Why is an understanding of the geography of the Book of Mormon even important? Or is it really important? Well, which is greater, faith or knowledge? Typically, I hear about half and half, um, people thinking that faith is, more, is greater or knowledge is greater. But again, I like to go back to the scriptures as the foundation. If you plant a seed and the seed grows, then what do you know? You know that it is a good seed, right? Alma 32, verse 34. And now behold, is your knowledge perfect once you've seen the seed grow? Yea, your knowledge is perfect in that thing and your faith is dormant, and this because you know. Obviously, knowledge is very important. As an example, one early spring morning, there was a young man that had a tremendous amount of faith and went into a grove of trees in western New York to see if he could find an answer to a burning question that he had. So he went into that grove with a tremendous amount of faith. But when he came out of that grove of trees that spring morning, he no longer had faith. He had knowledge. And that knowledge actually caused such strength in him that he was able to withstand all of the persecution and the problems, the challenges that he had to endure in his life, and also the, all the wonderful things that happened as well. That knowledge that he received that day carried him throughout his entire life to the very end when he gave his own life. Because he would not deny what he knew has always been a very powerful statement to me when Joseph Smith said this. He said, I knew that the Lord knew, and I could not deny it, what he had seen. So that is an example of how he had faith, but then that faith turned into knowledge. But one other thing that is very important to understand, and that is that knowledge in and of itself is not that strong. Laman and Lemuel saw angels and yet they still denied what they knew, what they had seen. Basically, I've come to the conclusion that, that knowledge is only powerful for those who have faith. And in fact, I had uh, one individual that said, you know, if you want me to believe in your church, he says, all you got to do is just let me, just let me hold those plates. Let me hold those gold plates. And my response to him was simply this. 
if you had the privilege of holding those very plates in your hands and turning those leaves over and feeling with your fingers the engravings that were put there by ancient prophets, you would still deny it because you have no faith. Knowledge is only powerful for those who have faith. And in fact, um, one of the things I find it interesting is that no, that, that no level of evidence is ever going to be sufficient for someone who refuses to believe. There is all kinds of scientific evidence of that exact thing happening. So I go back to the, the scriptures again. This is Doctrine and Covenants section 93, verses 24, 33, 34, 36, and 37. And it's talking about truth and its application here of why an understanding of the geography of the Book of Mormon may actually be important. Truth is a knowledge of things as they are and as they were and as they are to come. So truth is a knowledge of things. Things are physical. Okay? For man is spirit. The elements are eternal. And spirit and element inseparably connected receive a fullness of joy. And when separated, man cannot receive a fullness of joy. The glory of God is intelligence or in other words, light, which is an intangible kind of spiritual thing, and truth, which is defined as something that is real, tangible, physical, light and truth forsake that evil one. In other words, when you have something that you believe and then you find physical evidence that supports that, it's very powerful. Um, or in this particular case, as this is saying, if we have a spirit and we have a physical body that then they, then they are combined, then that also is very powerful. This is a let me, let me, quote, let me just break though argument a second. does not create <laughs> conviction. Lack of it. In fact, uh, I'm just going to say that, that, uh, uh, that, that I think that's something that's really important to understand when it comes down to our, our, our Heavenly Father himself. Basically, if you take the physical and the spiritual and you put them together, you have a fullness of joy, but would God still be God if he didn't have a physical body, if he only had just his spirit? And I think the, the answer to that is, of course, he would not be, because it's not enough, apparently, to just have the spirit. You have to have the, the spirit in conjunction with the physical, the, the, the intangible and the tangible together to, have, to, to become God. Yeah, when I first really knew the Book of Mormon was true, was probably the first two weeks on my mission. It probably <laughs> should have been before that. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you, when I knew it, I just ate up the Book of Mormon. I wanted more and more. I ended up reading it seven or eight times on my mission. But still today, when I met you about 12 years or so ago, mm -hmm. uh, and you were saying these other physical things, it's reminded me of Elder Holland's talk in 2017. Yeah. That you've got to have the witness, the greatness of the evidence, the greatness yeah. of the evidence. But if you have knowledge that supports it, the two together will become even greater. And that's what happened with Joseph Smith. Yeah, and there's also one other thing that I that I've brought up to a lot of people. People say, why, why are you so passionate about the Book of Mormon? Can't you just believe it on faith? I mean, you know, where's your where's your faith? And I said, you know, I think I show my faith by knowing that there's going to be evidence. The Book of Mormon states that it is a physical history of real people and places and events that really happen someplace. And I think, uh, I think it shows a lack of faith if we're not looking for those. Yeah. That's what I love things. about you. I, I grew up believing Mesoamerica because that's what I was taught everywhere. Yeah. I and too, I kept yeah. looking for it. And okay, where is it? Where is it? You know, I finally, just after my mission, I kind of gave up and said, well, nobody's really shown me anything. And then I became complacent yeah. all that time till I met you. Well, you have believed that it happened in North America for almost your entire life, unlike me, is what I understand. Well, I, well, I believe that at the beginning, when I, as my family and I read the Book of Mormon as a kid growing up, yeah. and I thought, you know, it's talking about a, a mighty Gentile nation above all other nations. You know, I was talking about, <laughs> you know, a, a powerful nation and so forth. and. A you know, land of liberty and things like that. Well, that's talking about America. And then it wasn't actually until I started going to seminary in, uh, in, in junior high school and, and then later in high school and ultimately in, in, in college in the, in the institute there at Utah State University 
where I was kind of taught that this that wasn't America. It the was actually thing. it was actually <laughs> Central America and so forth. Yeah. But there, but there's one other thing I wanted to bring up, and that is that, uh, and, I've, and I've mentioned this several times. I've had people say, well, you know, listen, the, the geography just does not matter. Okay, and I've, and I've said, you know, I don't think anybody's going to be denied access to the celestial kingdom if they can't properly answer the question of where the Book of Mormon took place. Okay? Right, but neither. But but I, I think it's still important for 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 two major reasons that that I want to add onto what I knew 15 years ago, and one of those is is that is that truth always matters. Number one, well, that's that's one of the things. Um, you know the. Uh, the, the prophecies in the Book of Mormon are to a specific nation that was going to be right. set up, you know, established, raised up, and, and so forth um, in the last days. And those prophecies are specifically to that nation. That nation. Yeah. And so if we don't at least understand what nation it is that they're talking about or to and prophesying to, um, what's the point of the prophecies? And then yeah. the other thing is, is that <clears throat> there's over 550 passages, folks, in the Book of Mormon that deal with geography. And that's quite a lot. And, and there may have been a lot more than that if you add the 116 right. pages <laughs> into it. Because I, I keep hoping, I, I, I tease people, say, uh, if someday if we ever find the 116 pages, I hope the first five or six pages of that are the map section. Very, yeah. <laughs> that shows where, where everything, okay, refer to map A, right. re re refer to map B, whatever. Uh, until that time, we have to be you know, open to further information and ideas. And, and, and we've gone, there's been a lot of changes. In fact, uh, from when I, when I did this 15 years ago, you're gonna see there's a lot of changes mm -hmm. that I've made in the last 15 years as, as new information and further truth and further light are brought forward. But this is what I wanted to, to point out, and that is that there's 550 passages in the Book of Mormon that deal with geography. Are we really gonna just ignore those? You know, if, if we're gonna ignore those 550 passages, then what other passages are we okay right. with ignoring, <laughs> right? I think every passage in the Book of Mormon is important and it was placed there on purpose by either, you know, Mormon or Moroni who were doing the, the total abridgments of the, of the plates. So if there's geography passages in there, I think they wanted us to figure it out. Yeah, and I also would add to that, it's not important for the temple recommend questions either of where was the Lord born? Well, some people might say Jerusalem or Israel or Judea or Bethlehem or whatever, but what's the significance of knowing where Mount Moriah is? There are three of the greatest religions in the world, the Muslims, mm -hmm. the Christians, and the Judas, the Hebrews, mm -hmm. that all worship Mount Moriah, where Abraham was to sacrifice his Isaac, son. Yeah. That's sacred. Well, there's nothing special about the land. It's not the land, it's the covenant. And the, where was the covenant made with the Lord when the Nephites and Lehites came here? Where was the covenant when the pilgrims came? Where was the covenant when the Jaredites came? This is the promised land. Doesn't mean we're better than anybody. It means this is what the Lord chose. There's, there's, there's this, this land plays an important part in the overall plan of the Lord yeah. for his children here on yeah. the earth. Okay, so let's go, go ahead. Now this, this next quote by Austin Farr actually was quoted by, by uh, Elder Holland, Holland yeah. in, the, in, in his address that called The Greatness of the Evidence. But it's a, it's a fantastic Belief. quote. What seems to be proved may not be embraced but what no one shows the ability to defend is quickly abandoned. Rational argument does not create belief, but it maintains a climate in which belief may flourish. So that is what we're attempting to do with this information, is to, is to show a rational argument for the, in favor of the truthfulness of the Book of Mormon and Joseph Smith as a prophet of God. And that is, um, and, but this is only really going to be powerful for those who believe. Because those who refuse to believe in the prophet Joseph Smith and the restoration of the gospel will never see these evidences, in, even though they may be right in front of them. So how should we begin our search for the lands of the Book of Mormon? These are some of the physical evidences that, uh, that are in what what we consider to be the land of promise, which is the United States of America. So that limits now where we are looking for the, the um, evidence in favor of the Book of Mormon. 
So where in the Americas is the one location that's absolutely known to have been a Book of Mormon site? Well, of course, that is the Hill Camorra in New York, USA. Beginning from this firm foundation, is there any qualifying narrow neck of land that could be found in the area and crossed on foot in a day and a half? Yeah. Somewhere in the vicinity of Camorra, is there a place, as it talks about this narrow neck of land in the Book of Mormon, um, is there a place where that might be? In this photo, you can see Lake Erie on the south and to the west, and then Lake Ontario to the north and to the east. Can you find any potential narrow necks of land that could be crossed on foot in a day and a half? This is a little more blown up, so you can see a little bit closer, but it's approximately 21 miles across between where the Niagara River runs from Lake Erie to the south up into Lake Ontario to the north. 21 miles is also a, an interesting figure because the average rate of travel for the pioneers as they were crossing the plains was between 12 to 15 miles per day. Now, how far can you go in a day and a half at that rate? Well, you'll find it's pretty close to 21 miles. Now, I'm not saying that this is the narrow neck of land, but it at least gives the possibility or the probability that this at least could be a, a realistic place to look. Okay. Would the Book of Mormon people... We gotta, we gotta stop right there because... Okay, folks, you're gonna see what we, what we thought we knew 15 years ago has changed pretty yeah. dramatically since then. And uh, this narrow neck of land is a whole different thing. And Ryan has done a, a yeoman's job as far as uh, trying to, uh, to, to discover. You know, there's, everybody talks about this narrow neck of land and thinks, well, when we take a look at the Americas today, you have North America, South America, and there's narrow neck in between it. But the problem is, and this is the problem that I saw 15 years ago, and others saw as well, is that, that that area around Panama is just way too, it's about 40 something miles, it's all swampy, or was back in the time. 140 is the smallest, 125. Well, that, well that, that's the other the end. There. Yeah, the width. Yeah, but the Panama area, which right. is kind of people go, well, it must be that, but then the Mesoamerica area, they're, they're talking about the, uh, the you know, a, a, you know, a couple Tarampu of different, the or, Darien or whatever. Yeah. Um, and that's like a hundred and something miles. It, nobody's crossing that in a day and a half. No. And so that was a major problem. And then we said, well, is it, are they talking about the same neck all the time? And at what point in the Book of Mormon do they even mention the first, the first mention of a narrow neck of land? For example, it wasn't until they were established in the land Bountiful 700 years after they arrived there when the first mention of a, land of, of a narrow neck of land happened. And you know what's really cool so, yeah. is as you look way up here. I'm gonna show you this. This is between Lake Erie over here and Lake Ontario. And see that in green? There's water between it. That we mm -hmm. now know and understand as Lake right. Waynefleet, which is in Canada, okay? This whole area I've blown up down here. There are actually okay. three necks in the Book of Mormon. The first one we believe is called, right up here, the narrow neck of land with that water in between them. So you see there's two little green lines here. Well, between Lake Erie and that Lake Wayne Fleet, there's a path between there that is more than likely only three to six miles between there that is even a more narrow neck of land than what you said in your video on 21 miles mm -hmm. because this, there's a second place called just the narrow neck. And then there's a third one called the small neck of land. And they're all in three different areas. So not this is where Hagar. Narrow neck. Yeah, this is the narrow neck. And this is narrow neck yeah. of land. And this is small neck. And yeah. then this is the narrow strip of wilderness. So if you understand the differences, which I've researched, I mean, take a look at this, for example. Do you know what this is along here? This is the Ohio, Ohio. Allegheny and Ohio River. But look what was there anciently. This is called Lake Tite. Mm -hmm. This is called Lake Monahagela, which is part of the, the waterway there now. Look at all that. Tell me that the Nephites in here were not nearly surrounded by water. I mean, look at all this water around them. Yeah. 
Okay. And we'll talk about that a little bit too later. So there was also, so this later on, I think, was known as Lake Tonawanda. Over here it is. Oh, Lake Tonawanda. This was is over here. Tonawanda. Right? This is yeah. Lake Wayne Fleet. Okay. So Tonawanda is part of the United States. Okay, but let's talk about that, the specific thing, which was the narrow neck of land. Yeah. I was talking about this in 15 years ago, possibly between here. Right. But it, but it didn't really make sense from the standpoint that it was, that it was closer to Zarahemla than we than this is. That Zarahemla, if, if, if the Lord got it right in section 125 in the Doctrine and Covenants, which we're going to get to in, in just a little bit later, um, then Zarahemla is over here. I don't know if you can see that or not, that's Zarahemla and Land Bountiful is here. This is kind of in between. So let's talk about this area right in between here, um, which is what we now, um, I think, have come to at least some conclusion, if, if you will, um, and by the way, you know, none of this is, is a hard and fast conclusion. You know, until the prophet comes up and says, hey, you know what, this is, what, this is, the, this is it, this is what we believe, this is the, the land of the Book of Mormon, we're here. Um, we have to be open to further light knowledge. Now, I, I, I do have one caveat with that, and that is that people say, well, how can you be so sure then that it happened in North America? If you're, if you're saying that, you know, because I've told people, if the prophet were to come out, you know, this coming April, <laughs> in the April conference, and President Nelson says, I've received a revelation, the Book of Mormon happened in whatever place it is, would you be with the prophet? And I said, absolutely, I'd be with the prophet. And they said, well, how can you be so sure then that your geography is right? And the answer to that is because I know that President Nelson would never receive a revelation that contradicts Joseph Smith and his revelation. And I also know if the prophet said that to me, I've told my wife, I would forget about the heartland. She said, no, you wouldn't. I said, <laughs> no, I would. But after I had prayed about it, because just hearing from a prophet or an apostle doesn't mean their opinion is fact. It means I better pray about it. Because the interesting thing is, you see where you said it was a 21 miles between here? You yeah. see these two little small lines here? This is the day and a day and a half for a Nephite to go from the land north to the land south. So the Allegheny River on the north of it is the land north, and the south of the Allegheny is the land south. Even though it's south down here and it's north up here, well, it's north up here and south down here, depending on where you're standing. So that has a lot to do with this yeah. that, 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 that was, that was another, another factor that, we, that uh, everybody needs to take into consideration when you're looking at the geography of the Book of Mormon is that each of the different areas um, had prophets that were that were writing about it from their perspective, from where they from where they were grounded, and so you know so you know the land of first inheritance was way further south, you know down around here, and they and they would say everything here is, is north, right? Right. But when they get up to the land of Nephi Lehi, basically the land of Nephi area, right. um, now all of a sudden you have you know lands above both north and south of yep. you. From this perspective, if you're up here, then most of your lands are going to be south of you, and not as much to the north. So, right. so it's going to be a perspective issue um, by each prophet. Yeah, and if you're standing over here, that could be the lake west. If you're standing here, this could be the sea west. Is what I meant to say. If you're standing down here, that could be the North Sea, and this could be the Northeast Sea. I mean, you yeah. know, it, it's perspective. Right. People. But but once you, but once they understood that you know, and they had people who had went out on scouting and so forth, mm -hmm. and, they, and they found out about all the different lakes, then they would have known, you know, that where, approximately where these lakes were located. Mm -hmm. And so it makes sense that later on in the Book of Mormon, they talk about these things like the, uh, you know, having the, uh, you know, large bodies of water in right. the north of where they were. But we still haven't covered the narrow neck of land. We need to cover that. Let's, let's cover that right now. So this, this is kind of a little bit blown up here. You might be able to see it as better up here. But this is something that we found that was really fascinating. And let me just kind of explain a couple of things. So anciently, the Great Lakes, there's evidence um, the, uh, the Canadian Natural Resources as, as well as the USGS and so forth, have, uh, they, they agree that anciently the Great Lakes were about 50 feet higher than they are currently today. So they had, they, their, their lake levels were higher. And so they find Native American um, remnants of their civilizations and their cultures were, were typically, they would, they would build right along the lake shore because right. that's where they can get the water the easiest, right? <laughs> but, but now the lakes have gone down and so where you find most of the remains is about 50 feet higher than the, uh, the, the current lake levels. Right. 
And when that happened, um, and, and what caused that to drain and so forth has, that there's a lot of the geological things we could go into there. But the bottom line is, is that when that happened, or anciently, these lakes were quite a bit larger than they are today. Um, I have, a, have a, a presentation where I show the, uh, the lake levels and so forth that I did, and then is when we found out about two bodies of water that uh, not many people have heard about, but uh, if you look them up on, uh, on, online or whatever, you can find out more about them. And that those two bodies of water here is an extension of, of the sea south. So if, it, if you take a look at the Great Lakes, basically, so you have the seas when they were, when they were higher, okay, they extended further down. So Lake Michigan, which, was, which is the sea that's mostly to the west, so that would be sea west, okay. You have sea east, which is Lake Ontario. You have sea south, which is Lake Erie, down towards the bottom here. And then up above that, you have Lake Superior and Lake Huron, okay. Um, and and, and uh, anyway, so that's, this, this doesn't show all the way up into that area, but it does right here. So right. this is Lake Superior and Lake Huron is up, up well, Lake Superior is not even in this map here. Right. It's up here. Huron. Anyway, so when all these lakes were higher, um, it created two major differences, two major changes to this whole topography. First off, the, the lake, Lake Michigan, extended down when it was 50 feet higher it came out in these kind of open plains areas here and created a marsh it's called the grand kankakee marsh kankakee okay. marsh yep okay and then then lake erie when it was 50 feet higher it extended down this way and you can see it up in this one right there and that's created what's called the great black swamp now interestingly the Great Black Swamp still existed even in the 1800s. 1840s even, yeah. And they, and they were still draining portions of that swamp to create farmland um, back in the 1800s. So we know that that was something that was, that was actually there. And, uh, and, that was a, a, that, and so those two, we found out, came to within how close of each other? This right here between this lake and this lake is about 25 miles from Miriam, Indiana to Warsaw, Indiana, there's a narrow neck that could be walked across instead of in water. And it's because of what's called the St. Lawrence Divide. And if you look here, the St. Lawrence Divide is this pinkish color. The St. Lawrence Divide is where if rain landed on the middle, rain would flow this way on this side of the divide and this way on the other side. So this river, Gen Lake uh, River Genesee up in here, and this one, they flow northward. And these uh, rivers flow southward. So that is an important divide along with what's called this, the Eastern Divide. And the Eastern Divide comes down and divides that even on one side or the other. So Basically the Appalachian Mountains coming that's down. That's right. Here. So everything else on, on the west side of the Appalachian Mountains flows into the Ohio essentially and everything on this side yeah. flows into, into the Ohio out and then the into Ocean. down to the Gulf. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay so that is a narrow neck of land that can be crossed on foot. It, it matches every description that's in the Book of Mormon. It was, it, was, it was discovered later on in the history. In other words, it wasn't in the land of Nephi area. Right. They, they, weren't, they weren't talking about this until they established Zarahemla and Bountiful. And that means that they wouldn't have found this until they got up into that Zarahemla and Bountiful area. Which Would you is mind the reason turning why that goes there. to Ether 10, 20? It's really simple. If you read in Ether 10, 20, this is going to be the key of understanding that our neck of land up here called the Niagara Peninsula is the key location. And okay, it's not the key location of like Darien or the Panama or that big neck down in Mesoamerica. Because as he reads in chapter 10, verse 20, okay. it says, Says, and they built a great city by the narrow neck of land, by the place where the sea divides the land. Okay, does the sea divide, like Ontario and Erie, do they divide the land? Yes. When you're in Panama, the land divides the seas. Yeah. Or Mesoamerica. It's America. opposite. That's yeah. what I meant, Mesoamerica There's and no Panama. place where the, where the seas divide the land in Central America. Right. The Yucatan Peninsula and Southern Mexico and, and Guatemala, 
the land is divided into two seas. Yeah. They're also very small. That's another thing that people don't realize that the, that the, the Mesoamerica setting for the Book of Mormon that's been proposed um, is really about half the size of the state of Utah. And, uh, and, and it doesn't, it, it's not a very large place. So a lot of, it means that everything was pretty much in that very small area. This yeah. is quite a lot larger, but they had over a thousand years. You know, the United States has only been around for about uh, 230 or 40 years as mm -hmm. far as a, as a nation. And so, uh, so that's, that, so this gives you an idea that they, they did some moving around uh, because the Lamanites kept moving them, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> driving them to place to place. But it's interesting that the narrow neck of, is by the place where the sea divides the land, and that's according to the Jaredites. That's right. It was okay. a Jaredite uh, scripture, Ether 10. Yes. The narrow neck of land probably had nothing to do with the Nephites. It had to do with the Jaredites when they were up here. Now, it existed during the Nephite time probably, sure. but they didn't talk about it. They talked about the small neck, like down here, the small neck, and they talked about the small, I'm sorry, the narrow neck and the small neck. Whereas those are Nephite, like in Alma 63.5, and this is Alma 22.32, up here is Ether 10.20. So, and we have found, look over here, we have found archaeological evidence. This is a only narrow neck of land, and this is it blown way up. This red is the One Oneida formation, and the Onan... Uh, Onondaga's yeah, yeah, this, formation. Yeah, this is the Niagara escarpment here. Yeah, the, all these escarpments and the two Onondaga lakes. Yeah. And then here, that little green part is the narrow neck that's only about three or four miles this way from north to south. So the, the Jaredites could have gone all the way along here to get out of that area and get over here. But they can't go through this big escarpment. That's why the Niagara Falls, because the escarpment cuts it off. Yeah, it's a, it's a it's a it's a geographical feature, right? An escarpment, yeah.